Hurricane Florence continues to be a dangerous Category 4 storm as it steams toward the U.S. East Coast. At 11 p.m., the storm center was located about 465 miles south-southeast of Bermuda and about 1,085 miles east-southeast of Cape Fear. Florence hasn't intensified and remains a Cat 4, but could be close to Category 5 strength by Tuesday. A Category 5 storm has the potential to cause catastrophic damage. Maximum sustained winds were clocked at 140 miles per hour. Evacuations have been ordered for parts of North Carolina, including Hatteras Island. South Carolina evacuates over 1 million people. Damage on the coast would be catastrophic from the storm surge. If Florence goes inland and stalls as projected, somebody is going to get a ton of rain, up to 15 or more inches. Damaging winds Thursday could gust to hurricane force in spots. Power outages, trees down, isolated tornadoes are all possible. The storm had been predicted to come into North Carolina just south of Wilmington as a Category 5 hurricane. North Carolina had never experienced a Cat 5 hurricane. The very definition states, catastrophic damage will occur. Power outages will last for weeks to possibly months. Long-term water shortages will increase human suffering. Most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks or months. We made preparations for the storm, boarding up windows, clearing everything out of the yard that would be projectile, stocking up on water and non-perishable food, enough to last at least 10 days, or we evacuated. We all anticipated the traditional type hurricane, storm for about 24 hours, wind, rain, I, wind, rain. The past hurricanes have brought us rain and the normal anticipated rainfall is about 16 inches in a 24 hour period. Hurricane Florence is coming straight at us and there is nothing in this atmosphere to stop it or slow it down, the weatherman told us. So we prepared for a wind event knowing the traditional areas that flooded probably would. Weathermen were comparing it to the worst storm on record, Hurricane Hazel. I wasn't even born when we had Hurricane Hazel, but just the words make me shudder. We all wrestled with do I evacuate or shelter in place. That's one of the hardest decisions you will ever make. You never know how strong people can be until devastation is imminent. Here at home, the phones and text messages began coming in from all over. I have two stalls. I have pasture space. I have room in my home and my barn. People from all walks of life were rallying to help their fellow horsemen. Folks offering to haul horses, help you evacuate, whatever you needed. The folks that decided to shelter in place prepared as best they could. Supplies, batteries, water, food. We thought we were all ready. On September 14, 2018, at 7.14 a.m., Florence made landfall and changed our lives forever. If anybody is watching this, can you please save our horses? They are evacuating us out by a helicopter. Our horses are down at our house. 225 Melissa Lane. Hi, I'm Jamie Johansson and my husband Eric Johansson and this is our house in Burgall, our little horse farm. And normally we don't flood during all the previous hurricanes. We've lived here almost nine years, never flooded before. We usually flood all around us, but we're a little island. We always stay safe. So we expected the same with this hurricane. We stocked up and made sure we had enough supplies for us and our animals. We had to generate two generators, in fact, for this time. Plenty of gas to run the generators. And we lasted through the storm perfectly fine. Trees were down here and there. A little bit of standing water. It actually started going away when our issue arose. The, down the road on River Bend, the water was about a mile and a half from our house, and we thought we were doing well because the water was receding. Then the rain started to come, and we woke up about three in the morning with the water at our doorstep, or about a, two steps to our house. And
then we had to wait till break, daybreak in order to check the animals or do anything because we know with being that deep of water and with the snakes and stuff like that, it just wouldn't be safe for us. As much as I was, he was holding me back trying to not go out the front door with flashlights and boots. And as soon as it got daybreak, him and I headed out to the horses and they were all just standing there with this pitiful look on their face saying, what happened? We were on dry ground yesterday. They were actually right where you see us standing, grazing the, night, the day before. And we got them all um, out of their paddock because they said it'd be safer for them to find their own dry ground, which they did. They, ran, they walked or ran down our driveway and found a leech field. It's just a little bit from our house and that was the only spot that was dry. They had grass and they were happy. And that's when my husband and I started calling for help and finding different resources that would come save them. Cause we knew there were people that would save us. So we weren't worried about us per se. We were more worried about finding resources that would help them. We contacted several different organizations and they all said, yep, we'll find them. No problem. We'll be there within a half hour. So we kind of sigh of relief and him and I started organizing us to get out and the helicopter which is just about here to get myself, my husband, our five-year-old son, my 93-year-old grandmother, and my mom, and all of our other neighbors that were still here because we never flood. We all went to the end of the road and him and I discussed back and forth whether to stay or go. We drove our F-250 through our three feet of water to our back porch to load up our whole family, our five dogs, our two cats, and everybody onto the truck. We drove out to the main road, where our main, where it's River Bend and Melissa Lane that connect. It was not flooded there. It was like a little, little island that the helicopter was able to pick us all up on. After we landed in the helicopter, that's where we were informed that help was not allowed to come. For many different safety factors, the EOC was kind of putting a kibosh on letting people in to save our horses. So that's when panic started to set in because I was like, I major guilt, I never should have left. But we moved forward, trying to contact as many people as we could find. We were on the phone all day and all night, just trying to find help. That very next morning, we drove out here to the water's edge on 53 and found people to come help us and boated out to make sure our horses were okay. Thankfully, they were all standing right where we left them. We couldn't believe it. We brought them hay and um, made sure they were all doing okay. And that's when we found uh, Chris and Scott with um, Oracle. Oracle, and they came in with their hovercrafts, and they were able to save two of our ponies. We had a mini pony and then a 12 hand pony, so those definitely would have drowned if we had left them in there, there's no doubt about it. And they actually got them on top of their hovercrafts and boated them on out. And they are actually up in Pennsylvania with some of my close friends, safe and sound. And then every day after that, we just kept on trying to reassess the situation and trying to see if we could get them out, keep them in, what would be the safer way to go. My husband every day, because he's much taller than I, <laughs> would scout routes and see, okay, you know, if it was up to his chest, we figured we could do it. But if it was any deeper, the horses would start to thrash and not feel safe. So he literally walked the about two miles every day to see if it was how deep it was in certain areas. There was several rescue attempts made where we brought out horse people and rescuers to try to get them out. But each time the water was just too deep and the tide went in and out and it was just too variant for us to be able to get them out. We basically waited it out until the water went down far enough where we could walk them out. And there was only one deep spot and that was on 53 and it was literally to our knees. So it wasn't even that deep. Everything else was walkable. During that time while we were waiting, our horses were at our neighbor's house and we basically filled a boat with hay and they just stayed there and we boated out every day to give them fresh water, fresh hay. We even got a salt block out there for them. And we, at, towards the end, was after the vets came out and Reagan Equine was a savior during all this. She came out with us and gave them fluids, made sure that they were healthy this entire time. And we um, just checked on their health and gave them lots of love until we could get them out of here. So when, uh it first happened when that morning that we woke up at three o'clock I was in my duck waders and the water was right here on me in this area and when the water crested uh, the fence line over here uh, it was about you know up to here when I was walking around in our house which is four feet off the ground I was still walking in knee deep water um, to that extent and it would just be lulls and highs so like the water would go down 
low tide and high tide so we just had to wait for that water to recede not to mention different areas were washed out so i would scout a, a route one way um, down river bend uh, through ken tames property one of our neighbors and uh, there was a ditch down there that washed out so we couldn't go that way because it dropped from six feet of water down to about 15 feet of water and then it would be dry land and luckily um, our neighbor buddy he was we were able to put our horses on his land where uh, that's where the water receded first and instead of sitting in knee deep water there they were only in about hoof deep water. When this was all going on our concern was the horses. We no hotels would take us because we had too many pets and they're all larger dogs they're all labs and American Bulldogs so we have larger pets no hotel would take us so we found a we stayed at a very sketchy motel, to say the least, <laughs> for the one night, and then we walked, ran into someone that actually met us up with a B&B in Clinton. That it was amazing, and then we stayed there for a little over a week. Yeah, the Ashford Inn. The Ashford Inn, and um, Julie. She has been so welcoming and helpful, and the town of Clinton has been amazing in this. It's about an hour, about an hour. yeah, about an hour away. And they, people just from the town we've never met before, bought us clothes donations, food donations, everything, a Bible for our son, everything that we could ever, you know, that we lost, they brought back to us. As you can see, everything behind us, we lost almost all of it. And they were so welcoming. Even in between stage, we don't know what FEMA's gonna do, whether we're gonna be bought out or we we're gonna be allowed to be rebuilt. Either way, if God willing, and we're financially able to, we're gonna try to move from this area so that this will never happen again. We've never flooded in all the times we've been here, and as far as all the neighbors that have lived here 60 plus years, they said well, this is never flooded, but we just don't want to take, ever take that chance again with our animals. And we'll try to find a place that's higher and drier. <laughs> Especially when they say, you know, Hurricane Matthew was a once in a 500 year storm, and then three years later, they're like, you know, Hurricane Florence is once in a thousand years, and that's a 500 year storm, and a thousand year storm within three years. So in three years, there can be something it's even worse. <laughs> even worse. Sheltering in place is the obvious choice when you have a lot of livestock or a lot of animals. It isn't cheap or easy to evacuate in a storm. Where would you even go? It's so large. Then, what we thought was a miracle happened. The storm weakened and came to us as a Category 1. Sigh of relief? Well, not exactly. The storm stalled for three grueling days It beat the North Carolina coastline with hurricane winds, rain, and tornadoes. I don't remember a storm ever in history that lasted for days. Moving at only two to three miles per hour, Florence took her time. What we didn't prepare for was the levels of rain that would come with Florence. Some towns reported as much as 41 inches. Rivers such as the Noose, Black, Lumber and Cape Fear swelled their banks to almost double what the levels in the past hurricanes had seen. Coupled with the storm surge and high tide, this was more than many inland areas could bear. One rescue worker told me that when they went out to find an address, they couldn't find the house. The GPS said it was there, and then they realized the house was underwater so deep they couldn't even see the rooftop. You know, as far as the, the horses and stuff out there, we've brought in some goats um, because you can get goats on a boat easily. But, you know, the horses and the cows, unfortunately, they have to shelter in place. But we do have partnering agencies like Department of Ag and the NC Forestry Service that are doing um, hay drops. Uh, Reagan Equine out of Wilmington, they've been great going out on boats and giving horses fluids and, you know, trying to help stage off the things that come from being in the floodwaters too long. And it's just been a huge community effort. I mean, you just can't really, you can't pull something like this off without a good tight bond. And, and animal people are great. I mean, animal people are some of the, the most caring, biggest hearted, giving people. And so they've stepped up. We've got tons of donations of food and feed and hay. And, you know, we're, we're here to help, you know, people during the storm and after the storm. And that, you know, that's something we want people to understand is that the storm is a big deal, but this area is gonna be impacted for a long time. I mean, there is just so much water. Someone who's lived here her entire life and worked multiple events in this county and across the country. I mean, when you see the aerial shots, it's just water for miles. And, it, and it's just, and to drive, to boat through it, drive through it, to boat through it and just see it. You know, we, we have these calls. We're like, go to this house, find our animal. And you're sitting there and you're like, okay, well, GPS says I'm here and I can't find the house. And you're, it's underneath you. 
I mean, that is, that, that takes a piece of you away, not only for the animal that may or may not have still been in there, but, you know, for the people that lost everything they had. And that's a hard thing to come back from. Yeah, she's so tired. She had her left eyes closed, yep. Hang on, girl. Is she on my right side then? She, yeah, I'm on right, I'm trailing right. Okay, I'll have to swing you to the left. Hey, somebody grab that. Nut can you? God love a chestnut mare. Oh, oh, Eric, I'm, I, Eric, I'm going in. Go. Go. Hey, go. Go. hey, watch where she comes up at. Hey, hey, partner. If you take the lead rope, I'll walk her out. Hey, hey, look at me. Look at me. Hey, she's caught. If you take, if you take, hey, she'll pop, she'll pop me out. She's going to try to swim over. I would be on the other side. Now, get, out the get out of the way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Here's the way. Watch your back. Watch your back. Good girl. Step up. Step up. Step up. Step up. Step up. Step up. Woo! Well, we've had some great saves. Um, the horses on the porch. That was that was a call we got, and when we arrived, um, the person that called it in was still on site. He said he didn't know whose horses they were, but. They had found one little piece of ground that they were touching, but they were still, the big horse was, you know, chest deep. The little, the little chestnut was considerably deeper. Um, you know, another rescue agency that wasn't a part of our team came in. They had a call on it too. You know, they had one plan, we had another. In the end, we kind of had to mesh the plans. I, I found the porch. I hope the porch owner isn't mad at me. But it was, it looked very sound and structurally safe for the horses to stand on, you know, for probably a week to 10 days is what I was guessing. And um, if his porch survives it, we should definitely find out who built his porch and highly recommend them. And that was a, I've done some water rescues similar to that. It's been a long time, Floyd obviously. And um, I mean, people just don't understand. Horses, horses don't swim like you think. You don't just hook them to the boat and drag them behind you. The, the black and white paint um, was in better condition because he wasn't as submerged and so he wasn't as, you know, shocky and he swam it pretty well. He was tired, but he swam it and it wasn't even far. I mean, it was just, you know, kind of just around the bend and I mean, less, less than a sixteenth of a mile easily. I mean, uh, and he got up there no problem. The chestnut filly, I think it's a filly, she, she panicked, she swam away, she didn't want to come, she didn't want to let us catch her. Once we got her on the boat, she, you know, they become dirty quitters sometimes, and, and she did. She dirty quit a couple times and tried to sink on us. And then at the porch, you know, didn't really have the energy to make that step, that jump up out of the water, and it was real, I mean, it was real concerning as to whether or not she was going to do it. But in the end, she kind of had a Hail Mary, and the teams that were there, you know, one in front, one behind, kind of pushed, and thankfully she made it to the porch, and all the pictures I've seen since, she looks like she's doing really well. And like I said, the vets have been out there and, and that's excellent. There's some more horses further down that have a dry hill. It was too far to swim the horses, but um, you know, they're stable. The Melissa Lane horses are still stable. And I'm sure there's more out there we don't know about. I mean, unfortunately, this is a huge county with a massive amount of livestock. And so there's no way to know. We had calls for, lots of calls for dogs and cats. The one call we went to um, it's the first time I've done a breach entry in a home and I can tell you that you know being in the boat and seeing it's one thing but when you hit the water and the water is this deep and you're wading through someone's house and everything they own is floating around you I mean it's it's really overwhelming it'll mean and then you're like how, how do the animals you're just like oh god where are the animals and you know, the refrigerators floating and the dryers floating and um, the dogs were on a mattress in the back bedroom and the mattress was floating so, you know, luckily they made a good choice and we were able to get them out. We had another call for a little Maltese and um, the first day the rescue team went there, the house was submerged to the shingles. So no window or door access and, and you're just, you're like, it didn't make it, it couldn't have made it. You know, the house is full of water and, and that's a hard blow. And uh, it just so happened the second day the team was going back to check the porch horses and they had a motor failure and it was um, right there by that address. And I was like, you need to go to the nearest address and, and sit and we'll send a team to get you. And the girl on the boat, she was like, you know, it's such and such address. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, but you really need to be right there. And she, you know, half hearted, she's like, oh, well, the water's dropped enough we can see in the windows. And I was like, maybe don't. I mean, I, you know, just the emotional toll. And um, 
the boat, when it kind of paddled, they kind of half paddled and currented over, and when it hit the house, the dog went to barking. And she called me, and she's like, oh my God, the dog's barking, the dog's barking. I'm like, well, don't screw around, breach entry, go get the dog, but don't go underwater, you know, because there's so much contamination in that water. And um, they found her. She was floating on a couch. You know, luckily it had a little bit of a vault, and so she still had that air pocket and didn't drown. And, you know, when we called that owner, I had, I had been a bad, a bad response person. I didn't call the night before and say, hey, your house was submerged, your dog's probably dead. I just, it's a long day and that's a hard call to make. And I think, you know, I give that to God. God was like, you know, leave it to me, it's coming. And I, I mean, I told her the second day, I was like, I, I should have called you yesterday and told you your dog was dead because that's what we thought. And God willing, it wasn't, and, and it's a miracle. And she came and got him that night and they were so excited. And I think there's a lot of judgment happening right now um, on pet owners and on rescue teams, you know, we have a job to do. We have laws to follow. We don't get to dictate who gets their animals back and who doesn't. I can tell you that anything that we see that, you know, obviously looks like something cruelty, not just storm related, it gets reported. Um, and when people want their pets back, we have to give them back by law. But, you know, a lot of people said, you know, these people left their animals, they shouldn't get them back. And some of these people did. Some of them didn't care enough, but some people didn't. Some people lived in these areas, like myself, for 30 plus years and have never had water near their homes, never expected this to happen. And then all of a sudden you wake up and there's five feet of water and you're being told you have Aravac and some Aravac ops don't allow you to bring animals. I mean, what do you do, you know? Um, and then like the, the little, one of the little dogs that we had, you know, the woman's like, I just ran down the road across the bridge to get my elderly handicapped mother packed up. Wanted to have her in the car ready and then sit the dog in the car with her. And then we were heading, you know, and by the time she packed up mom to come back across the river, the river was impassable. I mean, who could have predicted it would go that fast? She couldn't have, we didn't, you know, and that was an accident and, and it almost cost her pet her life. And so she doesn't need the, the bashing and the hate because it was an honest mistake and she was devastated that she thought her pet had died and so it is a trying time emotions are high people are tired you know we've been running for i don't know 15 days now um i would just ask people to be compassionate we don't always know everyone's circumstance until you've lived through a flood you don't know what it's like to walk in their shoes because they're you know we hear about help but help can be slow and, you know, when you're living in a, a school, in a shelter with hundreds of other people, you know, three feet away from someone you don't know, it is trying. And for some of these people, the only thing it's, they've got left are the clothes on their back, the family that's in that school, and their animals that are sitting over here. And so that's why we do make every effort to keep them together. And I hope that people can understand that. And we'll continue to support these pet owners and livestock owners, you know, for the next several months because we, our hay fields are gone. Several of our farmers lost all the hay they had. Most of our horse owners, you know, they've got damage to their barns and they've lost their hay. I think hay is gonna be a major problem for us through the winter. So, you know, people that can keep that in mind. If you have dry storage available locally for hay, let us know because that's something we desperately need. And then, you know, just being a good person. I mean, hey, I'm sorry you lost your barn. Can I stable your horses for a few months to help you till you figure things out? We've got pastures that are sitting in water with chemicals and things that we have no idea, you know, what effect that could have if the horses return to graze on it. You know, these are all, it's not like, oh, the water's left, now it's over. You know, the water's left and now we've got months of recovery. Um, Cape Fear Equine Rescue, I'm on their board. Um, we lost everything. That barn has never had that type of water in it and it, it had water to the roof. And I mean, I bet you that's a good 14 feet, 12, 14 feet high. Um, so we can't even go back. We'll never go back. It, it's just not even an option. And so um, the horses evacuated to my farm before the storm and we sent part of them out yesterday to a rescue in Western North Carolina. We're actually gonna try to disperse out the horses we have and start out over somewhere else new, <laughs> obviously further away from water. But you know, that's, that's not, a single story. There's a lot of people that are experiencing the same thing. And like I said, some of these people just did it two years ago, Matthew. And so it's really hard to know, do you stay? Do you rebuild? Do you go? We're going to rebuild. We're going to go somewhere else and rebuild. But for some people, they're not. And, and so monetary donations are a really big deal. You know, right now, Kate for Equine Rescue is looking for money to buy land to do their own thing. Um, I've heard that 
you know, there's people on these rivers that they have no other options. They didn't, they were uninsured. They don't know where they're gonna go with their pets. So there's, you know, groups or organizations that will work with these owners to help maybe foster their pets till they can get a better grip on things. Contact us because that's something we'd love to pass along to them and help them keep their animals as long as possible. Because the reality is, is once the Red Cross shelter shuts down, the, the pets have to go somewhere and they can't all go to the county animal shelter. And so we need options for those owners if they want to keep their pets. And if not, we have great rescues that will take them. They're not in danger. I know all this talk about euthanasia during storms and after storms, and that's not, that's not a municipal shelter's goal. We want the animals to get out alive and go to great homes if they can't stay with their families. Hello, my name is Hilda Memory, and I live in Whiteville, North Carolina. And I want to tell you about an experience with Hurricane Florence. And I want to tell you the trauma of my horses and the devastation and the actual horror that I went through. And I know I'm not the only one. I know that there are many others. We uh, knew, we knew Florence was coming and we listened to the weather and about the winds and we prepared so well for winds and the usual, the chainsaws and the things and the horses all had extra supplies and the dogs and cats because even with Matthew and Floyd and all the others, we um, had a little flooding in the, the road that goes to our house. We live a mile up in the woods and the reason we live a mile up in the woods is because we've rescued animals for over 30 years. Horses, dogs, cats, uh, sheep, chickens, anything people have abused or want to dump. We have been, we love them very much and they're sort of our lives. We haven't been anywhere in so many years because we have all those children. Well, we have flooded in the road before that goes to our house and we can get in and out with a boat. That's, that's fine, that's fine. We have never had to evacuate. We have never had our pastures flooded. Our horses have never even had to worry about anything. Uh, electricity, we've been out with electricity many times, so we're watching it and we lose electricity on Thursday morning before it comes at two o'clock in the morning. We said, yep, we got a generator, we're, we're good, we're doing good. So uh, we're watching and as the time comes, it's this usual, everything goes on as usual with the feedings and everything through the rain until Sunday night. Sunday night, the rains came and we're used to that, the ground's dry, but the rains really came and during the night, the flash flood, which I didn't even know what it meant, really. The flash flood came and water started in the pasture and then in the next hours, it was in the pasture. We started calling for help at three o'clock in the morning because we had 11 horses, 11 equine. We've got a couple of mules and horses and minis and a sheep. And we started calling and I'm sure everybody else was calling. And we said, you know, we need animal rescue, we have horses. We have horses, we have dogs, but we knew we could get them in a boat. Well, as soon as light came, water was up to my horse's necks, and that was the bigger horses, my minis, I already couldn't see them. The water was coming from two different directions, from two different uh, White Marsh and from Soul Swamp, and the current was unbelievable. It was something I've never witnessed before. So we took a boat and my husband can't swim, but I can and I was swimming, pulling the boat and it took me. And now I understand why strong swimmers drown. And uh, I grabbed onto a post and, and anyway, we got, we, we got saved out of that. And uh, we kept on trying to get them to the highest pasture. But the highest pasture was up to my my big mare was about, she's probably between 12, 50, and 1,500 pounds. 
and uh, trying to get them up there and round them up in nothing but a flood land, something that you just cannot imagine. I mean, it was, it was nothing. Everything had been flooded, the vehicles, the house, the first floor, it was going up to the second floor. But our horses were in trauma and we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't get them. We couldn't save them. There was nowhere to take them. And we had called and called and called for help. That's, that's one of the things we need to stress here is, is with people, especially with big animals, what do you do? What do you do? And it was hell. They finally came to rescue us uh, somewhere about uh, Monday morning, about 11 o'clock. And when we left there, I was watching, I was watching my, my horses um, try to keep their head up out of the water and breathe. And uh, that, that is something that you never, ever, ever, ever want to see in your entire life. Is that kind of thing for something you've saved from people beating and starving and you tell them that they can live there the rest of their life in happiness and run and play, which they had always done. And then you're watching them fight for life and they're so big you can't pick them up. You can't just handle it. You can't do anything. And so that will be behind my eyes every time I close my eyes for the rest of my life. But um, thanks to um, a network, on Monday, I think it was, uh, six, two mules and uh, four horses and a sheep was rescued from down there. And uh, they were the most unbelievable people that was in the world to me. They came from all over the United States, thanks to uh, Brandy Powell and, and everybody working to get a team together. And they worked 15 hours to uh, float them out and to swim them out and to do everything. And uh, then they brought them here to this barn where uh, they were kind enough to let us have some stalls. But the devastation is everywhere. And I know it happens all over the United States. Columbus County has never seen anything like this before. But I lost five of my children, five of the things I'd had for years who ran free and eat and just did as they pleased because they'd been abused their whole life before we got them. And they were starved and they were beaten. And they hadn't had that when they were with us. And I want the world to know that something has, has got to be done to put in place to help. We've lost everything. And everybody else is saying, my house flooded, my car's flooded, all ours did too, but when I look back, I didn't care. It wasn't that, it wasn't. It was that my children were dying and I couldn't do a thing. That's what this is all about. And, um, and I will help and I hope everybody else will help that we can do something about this kind of situation in the future. And um, I thank you for coming and listening to my story and, and please help. We get six horses and mules out this way. We're going to have to walk them out, huh? You think we can daisy chain them together? Or be a little risky in the water, wouldn't it? The bear is blind. Huh? The blind horse is blind. Oh, blind horse? Okay. It's okay, buddy. You're okay, buddy. It's okay. Which one are you gonna ride? <laughs> the little one. I'm gonna let him ride me. And put him on my shoulders and walk him out of here. I, I have no clue. Look at all the rain ride on this guy. You see how his skin's I saw it, yeah, yeah. He's gonna be in rough shape. Okay. He'll be up. Rehab. He'll be okay though. We'll put some neon spawn on it. Get a five gallon bucket. Yeah, paint it on.
grab his rope. Back it up, Terry. Where's the horse, Terry? Oh, what you got right there, guys? Let's let it settle down. Guys, we got a mile. I cannot talk. We have to go a mile. We need like a bar. We need a ramp or a bar. A short one. Some back legs, buddy. Yeah. Mm. You're a good boy. Gain the trust of one of them, you'll start gaining the trust of all of them. You're a good boy. He knows. We're here to help. Hey, buddy. We're going to get you out of here. Oh, and I'm uh, located here in Whiteville, North Carolina. And um, I wanted to express my story and my experience with the Florence from a different perspective. Um, a perspective of going out there and trying to help the people connect dots and bring people together and um, resources that were available but it's hard to figure out and navigate especially if somebody um, that isn't able or isn't out there on the le you know electronics and, and uh, the internet and only has their directory to call but um, I got a post or tagged in a post about some two horses needing rescue and um, I, a friend also Brandy Rogers got involved and we were going to tag team because we only thought it was two horses. Um, to be prepared you need to know as much as you can so I was getting up with the owner um, Miss Hilda Memory and I, talking to her I could see how much the animals were important to her that she could care less about anything else she just wanted to get her babies and uh, two horses and two dogs turned into um, 11 horses, the two dogs, a bird, and several cats, uh, not to mention other smaller farm animals that were foul. Uh, it was a lot bigger than two people could do, and more resources needed to be gotten. Um, so uh, Brandy Rogers and I, we, we spent time trying to connect to resources, and um, I kind of worked the ground and just connected those. I picked them up and led them. Um, I was blessed with the opportunity to house all of them here with me. And, um, and I've been taking care of them for the owner just so that they could focus on their stuff. Um, it, it's a lot to put everything together and it's a lot to make sure that everybody hears that it's not just abandoned. These are animals that were in a situation that you couldn't have prepared for. There's just no way to prepare for something that's unknown. You expect one thing only to turn around and find out the one thing you weren't expecting is the one thing that's ready to take you. And unfortunately, flooding is not something that just happens slowly. It happens very quickly. And uh, finding water currents is not an easy feat. Animals, the animals were scared. They're in high waters, unknown, it's getting dark. And, they didn't know all the people that were around them, and so they were uh, to to move them was a challenge in itself. I the whole time explaining to me how to get here by boat because he hasn't been here since the storm. He didn't have the resources at the time or anything to move all these animals or a place to go. And here we have two, unfortunately, dead horses. So, uh, they've been dead for some time, it looks like. I try to earn some trust because I don't think these guys have eaten in a few days. They're just so damn skittish and scared and crazy. What I got here, buddy? I got the goods. Got that good, good. Yeah? 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 Oh, now y'all want to talk, huh? Yeah, I bet you're hungry, ain't you? Get you some. Hey, meatball, turn around, I got more. 
Yeah, you know you want it. No, you don't. You're blindy. Easy now, you're gonna get my fingers. I like you the best here. My name is Alexandru Pop. I'm a fourth year vet student from North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I came down to the area uh, on the Sunday after Hurricane Florence started to come through. Um, I actually had an externship set with Pine View Veterinary Hospital down here and uh, the few days leading up to it we weren't really sure if I was going to be able to make it but uh, with my my awesome mentor and kind of my stubbornness, I decided that I had to come down here and it really wasn't an option for me. So um, these two guys, this is Chester and Beauty, uh, they were pulled out of the waters uh, shortly after the two minis were pulled out. And we first saw them after we treated them. Uh, they were actually still on the trailer right beside the water that they got pulled out from. And one thing that we hadn't really anticipated was something that us as people can really relate to but when you're in a crisis situation like that the mental trauma that they went through we didn't really think about so we approached them on the trailer expecting them to be you know have lacerations and have injuries and they were very very freaked out this is the best way to put it they we're very reluctant to trust us. You know, we're strangers coming up to them. We know that we're trying to help them. They had just been swimming in water that was near above their heads. And we weren't able to um, really do everything that we would like with them while they were on the trailer. So we did the best we could. Uh, we gave them, we did the best we could. We looked them over as, uh, as good as we could. We gave them uh, pretty good physical exams. Uh, one of the horses had a swelling on one of its legs and then some minor abrasions and uh, lacerations. Uh, we listened to their lungs and you could tell that they were starting to develop some pneumonia. Uh, they are running mild fevers. So we started them on antibiotics that day um, and then came back the following day and really pulled them out of the stalls after they had a chance to calm down a little bit and gave them a full physical exam, made sure that they didn't need any other treatment, and luckily they're doing good, and it seems like they're recovering just like everyone else is. My name is Dr. Christine Long, and I'm Pine View Veterinary Hospital in Bolton, North Carolina. We are um, a standalone facility, however, we do have three veterinary trucks that provide services to um, Columbus, Brunswick, New Hanover, Pender, Robinson, and Bladen counties um, locally. Which is, it's a large footprint, however, uh, with regard to Hurricane Florence, happened to be the exact footprint of how that hurricane came right across the coast of North Carolina. Um, and as far as my role uh, involving this hurricane and natural disaster, we have my team um, and I have been facilitating uh, adjunct um, assistance with these amazing rescuers um, who are finding the animals that are in floodwaters that are abandoned um, due to the inaccessible way for people to get to them, um, jumping in boats, driving down roads, getting to these animals to at least observe them, provide veterinary care uh, if needed, and um, and help them get on the road to recovery. Um, we were asked through um, a private message by Brandy to come and look at a few animals that were some of the first and, um, and only rescued in standing floodwaters post Hurricane Florence within a matter of days, as soon as we could could get out to them um, and see them, we were asked to come. Um, the first animals that were 
were rescued, legitimately pulled from the water and brought to high ground, brought to Brandy's facility, um, were the sheep, um, this beautiful intact male sheep, and um, two minis uh, that are just down the way here. Yes, sir. So the first animals that we had the privilege to look at post Hurricane Florence were these two beautiful miniature animals here. One is a miniature mule and the other one is a, a miniature horse. Um, and fortunately, we were able to actually get our hands on both of them, um, put a halter on them and a lead line and do thorough physical examinations. Uh, what we were looking for obviously were foot trauma, eye trauma, skin issues from standing in standing water, stagnant water at that. Uh, obviously, uh, the concern for these two and any animal that's been um, in floodwaters is aspiration pneumonia. These two in particular being some of the smallest that this owner has that we were able to rescue, um, we examined their respiratory system very thoroughly to make sure that we were accounting for any evidence of aspiration pneumonia. Fevers, lacerations were another thing that we were looking for. You know, it. Um, these two were swimming. They were legitimately swimming in water that was over their heads. Um, it was all they could do for two days to just have enough energy to keep their head above water. So you could imagine their feet flailing around trying to swim doggy paddle in a way um, they were knocking knees and hitting their legs on anything that was underneath them that they didn't know about. So when we did our examinations of these two um, they received a full physical exam. They were started on antibiotic therapy to help resolve any aspiration pneumonia. We did do some blood work to see how um, severe their infections were at the time and obviously got them started on anti-inflammatory pain medication to just help subside any discomfort that they were in um, at that moment. The, the second aspect of this that Brandy has been playing a, an extremely large part of is the nutritional acclimation back into a normal routine. Um, obviously these horses went from normal feeding habits to nothing for a matter of days and for, for a horse to do that that's that's not good um, they are at they were at risk for colic and laminitis and some other medical conditions that would have just been secondary to the stress and also the lack of nutrition that unfortunately they just weren't able to receive because they were swimming in water so getting them back onto a normal diet um, slowly to prevent any additional complications was extremely important and Brandy's played a really big part in making sure that that's happening correctly. These two are, they checked out just fine. They had no lacerations, um, a couple of abrasions, but nothing that won't heal really well. They were started on antibiotics and uh, have since received their second round of antibiotics. They've been eating, drinking, pooping, peeing, behaving great and loving life right now. So they are on the road to recovery very well. My name is Megan Butler. I'm from Rayford, North Carolina, and I've done animal cruelty rescue with Catherine Floyd since I was a little girl. Justin Wilkins from St. Paul, North Carolina. My first time on the rescue side, I've been in livestock, horses, equine, for about all my life. So uh, my first call was Friday before the storm. We got a call for some equine and there was no one there. Um, it was pouring rain, the storm was coming in heavy. Our trailer was literally swaying in and out of the road. Um, we still haven't found the owners to those, those ponies and uh, we're hoping that they come forward and claim them. That was really easy going into the week as we got going in. Um, my second rescue was, I believe, Monday. I had a call for 17 dogs and six horses. Um, three of them are present behind us. And the first group of horses were kind of aggressive. It took us a while to catch them. They were scared and we literally had to walk them out of about 
knee deep water and it was running pretty good. Um, that was the first day and we got the dogs out. There was cats on the premises and chickens. Um, the levee, the temporary levee broke and we had to leave three of the horses behind and the dogs, uh, well, some of the dogs, cats and chickens. Um, Justin tried to get to us, the roads were blocked. He couldn't get my other rig in to get the other horses in time before the levee broke. So we had to leave them and come back the next day. Um, Went in the next day, the recovered other three. Water still up. Higher. Uh, it, it actually risen overnight. And when we went in there, still had trouble catching one. Ended up probably water about mid thigh. Waiters we, weren't an option. We actually got them. Yeah, I had waiters on, and they filled up with water shortly after going in. But we got him, or the last one, got them all out. Dry land. Went in. The the same place had three dogs that were that was left behind at a different part of the rescue, and we had pulled them out of the water. And the guy come up and he was just very nasty about the situation, telling us that we didn't have the right to mess with his dogs, which was true, but the dogs were treading water on his porch. And so we had to sign them back over because they were his dogs. But when we went back the next day, the dogs were up on a hill surrounded completely by water and they were barking and they wanted us to get them, but we couldn't get them because we had already surrendered them back over to their owner. The next day we got two horses that were surrendered um, no, the same, matter of fact, the same day as we got the, the, the other we went three. Back and got the other three. Later on that evening, had two that was surrendered from another location. The, a few miles the away. people there had no food or water. They hadn't had, they couldn't get in or out because they had a mandatory evacuation, but they didn't listen. So their animals were suffering just as bad as they were because they had no way to get food or hay or anything to them. So. It was really rough. For their self, because they tried leaving town, or leaving home, going into town to get more supplies. And it and just wasn't an option. They, they wouldn't, they weren't allowed to leave and go into town and then come back because of the evacuation and trying to keep the roads clear for emergency personnel, first responders, line crews, stuff like that. And then the next day, we got a call, went down. We had a call for 13 horses that were loose. A lady was trying to get out of her property to go to a grocery store, and the horses were her neighbors. And she was just so selfish that she called us and pretty much wasted our time two days in a row. Um, we also got another call for 11 head of horses that turned out to be seven, and they were literally up to their neck in water. Down with the military, and they took us around, and we seen a horse from a distance, and she was up to her chest in water. Um, the owners did what they could. They left, there's two dogs. They left food for the dogs, left them on a porch, high ground. They opened the gate for the horse, but the horse was so good, she just didn't leave. And so we ended up walking her out. It was the river running over the road and water, it got up to about mid thigh and it was, we, it was running water, very, very running water. Um, we ended up getting the horse, two, uh, two dogs were signed over to the animal shelter and we got a cow that day. The people we dealt with that day was very difficult because they were from other states and they, they tried to come in and run things their way, but we, we were first in command, so we were always there first. Um, Which the two dogs that was recovered from that property and the horses. Very well taken care of. Very nice animals, and, but they were returned today. Yes. They got both dogs and we returned the horse earlier this morning. We had a call for another horse that same day. Uh, it was devastating because we had four rigs and we only had, we, we were blessed to only have one horse and one cow, but we had had another call for a horse that was in about 10 miles of water. It, the road was flooded. You couldn't get to her in or out. And we don't know if there was a horse there or not, but we had a call for a horse in water and we still haven't, we haven't been able to get back there to check and see if she was there. It was very devastating to leave her there and not be able to get to her. Um, Hello, my name is Billy Sue McDonald. I live at um, 541 Mumford Road, Rayford, North Carolina. I have been doing animal rescue for probably about 15 or 16 years. I work with Miss Catherine Floyd out of Robinson County Animal Cruelty. 
Um, she is a super lady. She has her hands full. She don't only do equine, she also does all the animals in the county. If they're mistreated, they call her. Um, during the hurricane, we have had many challenges and we have seen some things that were very upsetting, but we made it through those times. Um, we did end up with um, 21 horses, five pigs, and a cow. Um, we had, I, I had some amazing people working with me, actually. Uh, had a really gr good group of uh, young people. Um, my girls, I want to recognize very much so because I've told them they do not have to continue this when they get older if they do not want to, but they have been a part of this all their lives. And uh, Megan is actually my, my youngest daughter and uh, Alicia is my oldest granddaughter. And um, they're super kids. They love animals, but they're also the equine kids is what I call them. Um, we um, went into a lot of areas that were kind of dangerous. Um, we had a couple of horses that were surrendered because they were pretty skinny. I think you see a couple of them back here. Um, they were pretty thin, so we ended up, the animal cruelty uh, took those um, without you know, any problems because they were very thin. Um, some of the other animals were uh, in water. The kids, they actually floated out and uh, rescued those and um, they actually got the opportunity to ride with the Coast Guard and went in and rescued a, an Appaloosa horse. Um, we met some rescue people that a lot of them were super nice guys. It's cool to go and help with the rescue to pull the animals out or to pull the humans out, but where are you putting them once you pull them out of that water? That's the question. You, you don't have that facility. You don't really have a lot of facility for the humans, but you definitely don't have that facility for the equine. Dogs and cats, thank God we had dog pounds, we had Humane Society, we had portable trailers set up with kennels. That was awesome. But the equine has no place to go. So did we not only have to go in and rescue, we also had to worry about where are we gonna house these animals? How are we gonna take care of these animals? During Hurricane Matthew, Lumberton and Robeson County suffered extreme flooding. We knew that would probably happen again during Florence. What we didn't know was that it would be significantly worse than Matthew. Predictions for 13 feet of storm surge coming in on a high tide meant that the Cape River would crest four foot higher than Matthew. Flooding inundated thousands of acres of Moore, Robeson, Sampson, and Bladen counties. Levees were put to the test. Dams were breaking. Flooding so severe that I-95 and I-40 were completely shut down. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper urges travelers to reroute and go around North Carolina through Tennessee as more than 1,600 roads were closed due to flooding. Two weeks after the floodwaters receded, there were still 260 roads closed due to severe damage. Hardly anything was left untouched by Hurricane Florence for the entire coastline of North Carolina and over 100 miles inland. With I-40 and I-95 both shut down, towns were isolated. No food, no water, no supplies. Some for as many as 10 days. Uh, my name is Keely Tyler. I've been working um, with Billy Sue McDonald, who works under Miss Catherine of Robinson County Animal Cruelty uh, Control. She does animal cruelty investigations any other time. Right now she's strictly rescue operation. Um, Again, I'm just a minion. <laughs> um, not much to my story other than I help Billy Sue as far as like coordinate. We've been trying to get places. Um, it's been very difficult to find places to put horses at. Um, that's one thing we did want to kind of remark on. Um, but we've got a lot of good, good people in the community. Shady Acres has offered their property. They've offered their stock trailer and helped us out. Um, Billy Sue has her whole property, doesn't even have personal horses. It's all her horses. 
I've got some on mine. Um, there's several people, Selena Norton, several other people that have horses on their property just to help out because we didn't have any central area to take them to. Um, but if people are looking, they can go under um, Call Robinson County Sheriff. All the horses are registered through them, who we picked up, that sort of thing. Um, the biggest issue is getting hay and feed in. Um, Red Hendrix has been amazing. She put fence up. She doesn't even have horses anymore. Um, put fence up just to bring horses in. Um, has a veterinarian crew coming out of Maryland, I believe. I might be wrong about that. Um, and they're going to set up so that they can take care of these horses that have been in water for so long that they're going to have health issues on top of just having somewhere safe to be. Um, and she has donated hay feed by the ton. Um, she's been amazing. Um, Billy Sue's daughter, Megan, um, just amazing in the water. <laughs> um, there's a lot of water out there um, that does a lot of damage. Um, the first day we were playing in it. You know, you see the flooding, make the best of it. Thankful that nothing personally happened to us. Heart breaks for your friends. But then it just stays there and it gets worse and it's stagnant and it stinks. Um, we went out and we saw propane tanks busted, just spewing into the water. The same water that animals are stuck in. Um, dogs on porches, chained to porches. Um, Canine Global went in and literally dismantled a porch with his hands because people left their dogs chained on the porch and got the dogs out. Um, the Army's incredible. They're out there getting us to where we need to go. They stage our vehicles in one spot. We jump on their Humvees or boats, whatever is available, and you go in and get whatever. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are Everybody, they jump in and they help. Um, Billy Sue herself had to be evacuated. After she had collected horses for Lumberton, we got a air raid siren in the middle of the night. People started saying, hey, get out, get out, get out. I look, I'm like, oh, I'm safe. And then I start reading the other names of the roads and I was like, oh, we gotta go. And um, we evacuated my in-laws and then we went and got Billy Sue out. And in less than two hours, I believe it was 15 horses, nine dogs and a goat. <laughs> we got out, so the community here is is fantastic and the contributions are fantastic but don't let them stop but lumberton on fairmont i don't know that there's anywhere in fairmont dry um vass which is in another direction but vass is underwater um there's just so much of lumberton it's just and it's i don't know how to pull it, say it politically correct but it's the the people that are already hurting in day-to-day -day life. So this is just beyond devastating. It would be devastating to folks that are okay, that are, you know, not suffering, not living check to check. These are places that aren't even making it check to check. Like, it's bad. Um, all And then the government offices where those people get assistance at are underwater. So even where they go to get help, is underwater so then they it's a waiting game like you're waiting to see where you can go to get help and you're counting on churches and Red Cross is set up and that sort of thing but still it's still getting there uh, we saw a lot of people sitting on porches I mean you're just sitting on porches and they're waiting for folks to get out there and get them and I know a lot of people I've been guilty of going why didn't you get them out of here before now but when that isn't an option, like you don't have the funds to just jump up and go. You know, we can get human, you know, we let our human emotions get into us. And we do. There's a lot of times I'm like, hey, you should have been out of here already. But that I don't think a lot of people, if you're in a certain social standing, you don't look at it from like where they're at. Or a lot of older folks, they've lived here generations and generations and they're not leaving. They're going down with the ship. but then reality comes and the water's there and they know that they need to get out but they don't have a way out so um percentage wise like how much is underwater i don't know it's it's a lot it's a it's just a lot I mean, my sister-in-law and we teased her a little but she was crying she works for shining star in lumberton she didn't have a job to go back to um my husband's home he's a long haul truck driver but he couldn't get a route out um he left two days in a row trying to get 
to where he needed to go, came back home. So, um, so he's going out Monday, <laughs> but the roads, the roads are gone. So even if it's not necessarily underwater, getting there is a challenge. Um, I don't even know how to tell you how many businesses are underwater or damaged to where people can't come in. Or even once the water goes down, you're going to have mold and water issues and that kind of thing. So um, it's, it's, it's going to, it's a long-term ripple effect. It's going to be going on for like, who knows? Uh, there's people who hadn't even recovered from Matthew. And now this is, I don't even know how to explain the magnitude of what is what it is. The thing with Matthew is we had that rain before. It wasn't just Matthew, it was we had like two weeks of rain before we were saturated and it stormed so then when it went down to like Florence we kind of it went from four and everybody was like oh, and then we relaxed because oh okay she's it's a cat one we're, we're gonna be okay and we're, we're not. Um, even our home, we were very fortunate, very blessed. The water came up to our house, our house sits up, so we're okay. Um, the water sitting there, it's inconvenient, but we are okay. But it's places that never flood. Um, again, I try not to cry when I talk about Ethlyn, but she doesn't flood. Places that weren't even on the radar to evacuate or on the radar to even, other than to look out for wind, they were just sitting there like they would have been an option to take place, our animals too for evacuation. They were an option because they weren't, they were safe. And they're done, like, they're not done. They'll survive, we're gonna come back, but Everything that they have worked for and they built is gone and they're not alone. They're not the only ones. And so, I mean, it's way worse than what we saw with Matthew. It's like Matthew and then a little bit, a little bit more. And every time we thought, okay, we're good. It's crest. We're not going to flood anymore. We would get a call. And um, well, actually, we didn't even have the call. We were out there. And they said, the water is going down. We were like, yay. And they said, but it's about to go up. We had a sheriff officer pulled up and say, we're going to get about two more feet overnight. And we were just like, we can't get to where we need to now. What are we going to do? And you're saying that more water is coming in. Like, it's, it's scary and it's, we want an end in sight. <laughs> it's frustrating. Um, you're angry. Uh, again, you're like, because you're angry, you're like, why didn't they get out? We can't get to you, why did you not get out? Um, there's a lot of what ifs, and are they gonna be okay? Um, the particular one that we spent, we were four miles. Every direction we went, it was like we were mice in a maze. We get so close, and the road go down. And they, they, they had to block it off as protection. And you turn around, you, you try another way, and you get blocked off again and oh, I know another way, and you go and you're blocked off again. So there's a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, um, you're hurt, and then you go home, and I know um, Billy Sue was consoling her daughter the other day, um, telling her she had nothing to feel guilty about, and but you feel guilty because you know they were there. Um, fortunately, the ones that we circled around that particular day, I was there. Um, the, I believe K9 Global got them out. Um, I believe that's who got them out. Um, and, you know, they just, those guys are amazing. They came up from Houston, Texas, and they've been out there every day working in conjunction with the Army and stuff. So um, you go back and you, you go, okay, good, they got them, but then you don't always know if that's gonna happen. Gas is coming back, but groceries, oh my goodness. I mean, I just went to go get eggs and I had to circle back and go all the way into town where usually, oh, let me shoot over to Dollar General. <laughs> That's not happening. You're not shooting to the gas station. We're in the country. We don't like to drive into town for much and you're having to go all the way into town and hit the um, bigger areas to try and get stuff in. And um, But like the smaller places just don't, they don't have it. Um, even Walmart though, uh, 
I didn't need milk, but I told my husband, I was like, look, there's no milk even, you know, there's stuff's just gone. And um, basically the stuff that's easy to make because people aren't, there's still some people without power, that sort of thing. They're, they're camping in their house. <laughs> so, I mean, bread, that kind of thing, they easy junk food, that kind of thing, easy stuff, then that's the first thing gone off the shelves. We haven't even taken any as far as like monetary fun, just because there isn't a way to track it and they always want to be transparent. Um, they want to be able to show where this is going and that sort of thing. If anybody wanted to make like monetary contributions, I would probably contact um, the Robinson County Animal Control and ask for Miss Catherine specifically. Sorry, I don't know Miss Catherine's last name because she's just Miss Catherine to us. Um, but if not, Billy Sue McDonald um, would know. And um, everything that we've taken in are supplies from everything from feed scoops because these horses are in different places. So we're handing feed scoops out, buckets lots of buckets um, we keep going through buckets because the horses are in smaller areas than they're used to and they're fussing and busting things and that kind of thing um, even corral panels or temporary fencing um, billy sue put her personal panels at my place for some of the extra horses and they're not happy to be in the situation they're in some of them are not even hands-on she's got some uh wild mustang they're not wild mustangs but they're mustangs that were saved and the, the person that adopted them hasn't domesticated them he's just loved them and looked at them from afar so when it came time to get those out that was a handful so um, they can't just be turned loose with everybody else or stalled up um, different things like that that we just kind of take for granted any temporary fencing buckets um, of course hay feed warmer um, these guys have been standing in water they need warmer first aid vet supplies um, yes Donate to the local vets and say, hey, I want this going to, you know, specifically to this person's horses and that sort of thing. I know North Star will take donations and go take care of things. Um, that's with Dr. Kim Crivet. To um, like folks that are looking for their horses, we ask that you do go through Robinson County Sheriff Department. Call and ask them first um, because we can't have anybody just showing up to our property going, uh, that's my horse. There's too many folks that are taking advantage of this situation that they can't don't show up because we're not we're not going to be as friendly <laughs> if we don't know you're coming and you're trying to claim something that we're they're in our care we're supposed to be protecting them um, any identifying type things i know that before the hurricane hit um, everyone i know went out took pictures of their horses um, i called my vet's office to make sure that they could verify for me hey these are her horses um, your Coggins, of course, most vets I know will email your, your Coggins and they have pictures on them now. It's not like the old, just yellow piece of paper anymore. Um, just identifying things or even, in, you can say ones with you riding the horse, but more documentation generally. Like, uh, like I said, all my phone has all the pictures of my horses from every viewpoint and it's, you know, time date stamped kind of thing. And um, uh, the vet's your biggest ally there. Your vet knows you, your vet knows the care and that type of thing with your horse. Too, if your horse has special needs, dietary, that type of thing, if that vet knows then we can also start because not all these horses can go straight back home. These people don't even have a home to go to. So information like that, even if you can't pick your horse up, notify someone that, hey, I had X amount of horses and this one, my hat, we've picked up older horses and you know, just anything. There's some that need special farrier care and that kind of thing. And if you've already been working on a routine with them, we need to know it so that we, we can, we don't want to make your horse sick because we're giving them what we have available to us. So, and you know, usually you try to put new feed slowly and all that. There's none of that. It's, this is what we got. Here you go. So any, anything like that, just identifying and still reaching out, even if you can't pick that horse up even because I know a lot of people would hesitate like I can't take the horse back are they going to charge me are they going to do this or that personally we're not charging you to pick your horse up this is voluntary we're looking out and we would pray that someone would look out for us if we were in the same position. I'm Marguerite Ayers I have a small farm here in Hampstead North Carolina and I was reflecting on Facebook about uh, the experiences of the last couple of weeks having to evacuate this entire farm, taking all the horses away. Um, the just complete generosity and amazingness of Jeff and Amy Wiley in Monroe, 
who took in so many of us in this local horse community. You know, one of my girlfriends who was there described it as, we're so used to being in the dirt and having to get back on. Um, and as she put it, she said, you know, George Morris said, if you can't go to the hospital, you have to get back on. And, um, you know, I think, I think we horse people, we just, by nature, because of what we do, we, we have that resilience and we understand the importance of, of lifting each other up in times like this. And we did that in spades, all of us. You know, all, the, all those who are not so lucky are, have been really on my mind. And I was, I was reflecting on um, the things that I took with me, assuming that my house was not going to be here when I got back. Um, or going to be this high in water and things would be ruined. And the things I took with me were my World in Congress top 10 buckles that I worked my entire childhood and life to get. Um, a few paintings, obviously horse photos, children's photos, um, my Harris saddle that I waited half my lifetime to earn the money to buy. Um, and something that um, to me, when I got home became really symbolic and, and um, meaningful of, of what this storm was about. Um, this, this vase um, got packed in a duffel bag full of dresses and clothes. And um, this vase belonged to my children's great-grandmother who left Poland um, when the Nazis were getting ready to storm her farm. She was a farm girl. She showed me pictures when she was a kid of um, riding plow horses around her farm in Poland. And um, we bonded, I think, because of that. And she told me the story about um, taking this vase with her quickly off the mantle in her house um, when she had to leave and packing it at all the things, packing it at all the things that she had to take with her, um, knowing that she would probably never see her farm again and um, wanting this vase as a reminder of the flowers that were in it and the beautiful life she had before she left Poland. So this vase ended up, when I met her, um, on a mantle in Brooklyn where she and her husband settled and she became a seamstress and sewed beautiful wedding dresses and they made a new life. They started completely over. And um, that's, I, I look at this now and think about, we humans, unfortunately, sometimes we do have to start over. And um, it's not by our choice, but we, we have that spirit and that resilience to do it. And, um, you know, I, I think about this base and I want to say to all my, all my horse friends and everyone who's struggling, um, you know, this isn't a war and um, we'll get past this. We'll help each other, we'll lift each other up. And, um, you know, like this face, it's, it's a reminder of um, we do rebuild, we do recover, we do get back on our feet.